Good morning, everybody. Um, this is meant to be, I think, your substance misuse uh, module, and uh, you've got a, a, a real treat, I think, because we're having a little bit of a different um, event from the usual Michael Bergen-type lecture. We've invited Dr. Marie-Claire Van Hout, who is a lecturer within the School of Health Sciences here, to give you um, a talk on a project that she's leading called Code Misused. And uh, Code Misused is a major European Union project. Uh, she's going to tell you a lot about it, but just to tell you that the funding that she won uh, for this project is over two million euros. So it gives you an idea of the extent that this project uh, is, is covering. And uh, in the context of today, perhaps in some ways, uh, this lecture is very apposite because I don't know if you heard, but it's all over the media in the UK this morning uh, about a young lady who was 21 and she sourced slim tablets on the internet and took, I think it was eight of these slimming tablets, felt a bit unwell, went to accident and emergency, said, I'm feeling rather ill, told them what she'd taken, they did a blood test and they told her, you have three hours to live. And she promptly dropped down dead within the three hours for sourcing medications over the internet. And part of Code Misused is actually looking at uh, how people source coding, whether they source it over the internet. So this research is very apposite in terms of things that are happening in the way that people are now engaging with medications because in a funny sort of way, medications are much more available now than they used to be. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Marie Claire and uh, I've got prompt notes to help me. I've actually known Marie Claire, well, for about uh, seven or eight years now, isn't it? And uh, in that time, she has built a international reputation uh, for her addictions research. In fact, I would go so far as to say, at this point in time, she is probably the most well-respected addictions researcher in Ireland. Nothing happens now around addictions without some reference or invitation to Marie Claire in relation to addictions research in this country. And to just give you an idea of the power of that reputation, Marie Claire is responsible for WIT being an approved center for addictions research for the European Medicines Agency. We're one of only three in the whole Ireland of Ireland to have that uh, acronym, that uh, uh, recognition. She's uh, also a member of the European Network of Centres for Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacovigilance at the European Medicines Agency. And she's an associate member of the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Other Drug Abuse Research Unit of the South African Medical Research Council. And she's a visiting research fellow at the Center for Public Health at Liverpool John Moores University. She's a consultant for the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addictions. She's also a consultant for the European Research Executive Agency, the Mary Skoldowska Curie Actions Rise, where she assesses submissions for research funding. And she's also uh, 
a member of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, where she's an independent project evaluator. So she comes with a fairly significant and hefty CV in this whole area. And we're very lucky to have her. We're very lucky that you have access to her. And I hope you'll find her lecture of at least some interest, bearing in mind you've got exams coming up. Okay, so Mary Claire Van Hout. Thank, thank you very much, John, for that. Um, and thank you all for coming to the lecture. I, I know what it's like to have exams coming up and thinking you should really be in the library rather than listening to me. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I think, you know, maybe in a few years' time when you're working in practice, you'll remember this lecture and, and, and think about it. And it's an interesting topic for me anyway. Um, my background has always been illicit drug use. Uh, and I've recently moved into medicines. And the whole reason why we're now consumers of medicines, we're deciding what we take, how much we take, when we take, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. One of the other um, interests that I have is um, image and performance enhancement drugs and why you know, we think we can buy uh, medicines that change our appearance um, and that we decide how we want to look. But that's a whole other topic for another day. So today um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about code misused and codeine itself. Um, yeah, just to, to say again about the type of grant that it is, um, John has given it an excellent uh, kind of introduction, but it, um, the grant is actually based on a funding of transfer of knowledge between industry and academia. Um, so it's not as straightforward just funding for research. Um, so in this case, the industry is pharmacy. Um, and so, you know, it's been absolutely paramount for the success of this project to have pharmacy um, staff, pharmacists, frontline staff, managers, all involved in this project um, to get it from A to B. Um, so we have six partners. Um, if you look at the top, it's WIT and Cara Pharmacy for Ireland. Uh, you might be aware that Cara Pharmacy is owned by Ramona Nichols, who's quite famous on the Dragon's Den on RT1. Um, it's a very interesting company, very progressive as well. Um, particularly given Ireland with the economic downturn, pharmacies are, are not doing so well, but Cara Pharmacy is expanding all the time. Um, and then in South Africa, we have the Medical Research Council and the Local Choice, uh, which are a community-based pharmacy chain in um, the eastern uh, part of South Africa. Um, they've also partnered with a very large uh, national chain, so we have coverage for the whole of South Africa, which is a massive achievement. Um, and then in uh, the UK, we have King's College London, um, the Institute of Psychiatry, and also the Florence Nightingale uh, School of Nursing. Um, so they are on board. Um, and then for the UK, we have Weldrick's Pharmacy, which are a large chain of 79 sites uh, based up in the northeast of England. Um, so basically, just to say how this grant, this grant works is um, this figure here behind me is a Gantt chart, uh, which has been the bane of my life since September 2013, if not 18 months before that. And Martina has been fantastic in trying to help me get it, get it, you know, all fixed and that. Um, what it shows there is is the 27 researchers based on the academic fellows and the pharmacist fellows as well all going in different directions to different partners. Um, so, you know, the academics would go to the pharmacy sites and the pharmacists would come to the academic sites. And meanwhile, the top line would be whatever research work package we're working on. Uh, and that's basically how this grant worked. Um, we've got another 10 months to go, so we're nearly kind of at the end of it. And thankfully, we have managed to commit to all the months that we said we would commit to with the EC, which was great. And that's what calculated the 2.04 million euros. So it's fantastic that, you know, the pharmacies were able to send people on secondment, and so were we. Okay, so basically, what, what is code misused? Um, 
Right, the topic is codeine use, misuse, and dependence. So looking at patterns of the consumption of codeine-based products. Um, for here in Ireland, the most kind of notable ones are salpidine and norofen plus. Um, Looking at misuse uh, in terms of there's a whole range of different types of misuse of these products and then ultimately dependence where people become kind of caught up in habit forming use and they become addicted and ultimately require treatment. Um, so we were trying to scope out the issue really from all kinds of different perspectives. And the perspectives were national stakeholders from the medical side, from the pharmacy side, from the addiction side, um, from health promotion side of things in each country. Um, the consumers themselves, in terms of customers going into pharmacies purchasing codeine-based products. Um, so what level of awareness do people have that Norfem Plus is addictive? Um, so we don't know, we haven't done that part of the study yet, but we have sort of done most of the other parts. Um, also looking at medical prescriber attitudes, I mean these codeine-based products can be prescribed as well for pain, um, and to see what their perspectives were on their patients becoming addicted or perhaps not using it the way it should be used. Um, pharmacy professionals as well, the day-to-day -day of people coming in requesting Norofen Plus and the suspicions around misuse and the decisions whether or not to dispense. You know, because pharmacy, pharmacists are the custodians of medicines, the safe use of medicines. So it's their decision if somebody can actually buy Norofen Plus, here in Ireland anyway. In the UK it's different, you can, you can buy it very easily and South Africa as well. Very few questions asked. Um, also, uh, the addiction treatment professionals, uh, in terms of one of the interesting things is that people who become addicted to codeine-based products don't readily identify as being a drug addict. So there are huge barriers to accessing treatment and huge stigma around addiction. And so these people don't really end up in addiction treatment. And the ones that do, the, the general course of treatment is the prescription of methadone substitution or buprenorphine, um, which again carries its stigma as well in terms of having to go into the pharmacy and consuming the methadone on site. So not a pleasant experience um, and has great repercussions for um, outcomes and treatment, successful treatment outcomes. And then the very last one is internet monitoring. And so King's College are the lead on that. They're monitoring um, the turnover of online pharmacies that are on the market, visible on the main internet and selling codeine-based products. And also the monitoring of drug forums uh, where users would give information to each other on which codeine-based products to buy and how to use or misuse to the best intoxicating effect. So that's kind of the scoping out exercise. Um, and ultimately, what, what do we want to do with all of this information? Um, one of the, the things that the EC said to me when I went to the very first meeting in Brussels was that code misuse could not be just a data collecting exercise. And you know, I think we all get so caught up in collecting data, writing journal papers, and that's it. Um, the European Commission are now very, very preoccupied with public health impact and the impact of what research does. What do we want to kind of get out of it? Um, so this here is a list of different things that Code Misused could hope to contribute to in terms of guidelines. Um, so just read them out really quickly. I've got more information on it later. Um, but basically the manufacture of products, how to monitor and how to have a surveillance system monitoring the misuse of medicines, not just codeine, but other medicines that are misused. Um, information in terms of what's inside products and also the information that the dispensing technician imparts to the customer. Um, responsible prescribing in terms of what doctors prescribe, is the dose correct, is the length of the prescribing regime correct or not too long? Um, and also, are they screening their patients for suspected aberrant behaviours, um, these suspected behaviours that are caused by misuse? 
Um, risk management and clinical audit. So what we, what we also found is there are quite a few rogue pharmacies out there who will just freely dispense um, because at the end of the day, money talks. Um, and so if you incorporate training and clinical audits on a regular basis, you would hope to phase out that kind of activity. And um, one of the great things is that the, the clinical audits that Code Misused has written have been given to the national regulators in each country. And for the Irish one, they're very keen to implement. And the way they implement that is with uh, mystery shoppers. Uh, so that's a plus point, and that you know, shows a bit of impact for Code Misused. Um, the next one is pharmacy screening and brief intervention. So how can the pharmacist screen all customers who come in asking for a codeine-based product? And how can they intervene? How can they give information that might just stick in somebody's mind and might prevent them from misusing and, and getting caught up in habit-forming use? Then we have internet supply and drug forum monitoring. The next one as well is interesting, it's the CPD training. So all the information that we collect is now at the moment being phased into a, um, an online portal that's hosted by the University of Manchester um, and for a pharmacy and also for other health professionals. So all the information we have is now going to be disseminated to that population as part of their professional development. Um, and the last one is specific clinical treatment protocols um, for people who are dependent on codeine. So perhaps to see, is it better to use methadone? Is it better to put them onto buprenorphine? Or do we put them onto dihydrocodeine and then try and phase them down themselves? And secondly, where is the treatment best placed? Is it in a residential center? Is it in the community? Is it a combination of the doctor and the pharmacist working together? Okay, so just to say to you that the type of coating products, that they're mostly tablets, um, and they're very often used for the management of mild to moderate pain. Um, they're also present, codeine is also present in cough mixtures, um, so it, because it has antitussive properties. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's tablets. The regulatory controls are, are very varied across Europe, varied across the world. For example, the US, there's only a couple of states where you can actually buy codeine over the counter. They're extremely strict in comparison to the UK, where you can walk in and ask for a packet of cocodamol with no questions asked. Ireland sits somewhere in between. The pharmacist uh, has to come out when the customer requests the codeine, and you'll also notice that those products are not visible to the customer. They're hidden in behind in the dispensary. Um, and so the pharmacist has to ask some questions about what other pain medication is being used. Has the customer tried paracetamol or ibuprofen as a first line course of treatment? And if the answer is, yes, I have, and it hasn't worked, then the pharmacist has to make a decision whether or not to sell. So these are, this is a photograph of all the different type of products. Um, there's so many of them, but these are, I suppose, the main market players at the moment. Um, and just in terms of the, the guidelines for dosage as well, um, what's interesting is if you take a dose higher than 60 milligrams, you don't have extra pain relief from it. It doesn't improve in its efficacy. And so generally it's 240 milligrams is the maximum dose per day taken in four doses. Um, so anything over that is, is not gonna work for pain and it's deemed misuse. And the problem is twofold. One is that codeine has an opiate effect. So opiate effect is, is like a very, very mild um, effect similar to heroin. Heroin is also an opiate. Um, and then, of course, tolerance uh, develops quite quickly. Um, within three, four days, if you take a codeine-based product every day at the same amount, you will experience tolerance, which means that you're not getting the same effect and your pain may not be managed. So that, those are two factors that contribute to misuse. Um, I think as well, just to say that there has been a global shift as well in pharmacy practice um, and coming from the regulators as well to promote um, 
sort of public health, public self-care. So it's to, to promote a shift towards people looking after their ailments in their own way um, with over-the-counter medication, um, designed as well to reduce the draw on primary health care services. Um, and so, you know, there's pros and cons to it. What it does do is it opens up the amount of um, products that are available to consumers. Um, and it also opens a door towards potential misuse if people aren't advised at the point of sale on how to use these products correctly. Okay, so just in terms of misuse, um, it's a very wide-ranging definition. Um, so it includes with or without prescription, um, where adverse consequences outweigh the benefits. This would be kind of at the end of that continuum. Um, for intoxicating purposes, people purchasing coding for that reason only. Um, using at higher doses than, than that's recommended, so higher than the 60 milligram dose. Um, and also for longer than advised. So at the moment, they're advising three days and no longer. Uh, so this is people who use long term or even longer than three days. Um, and I suppose to say as well that we don't know what the prevalence is of this because um, it's such a hidden, hidden, hidden phenomenon that you know, it would be very difficult to find out how many people in Ireland are misusing codeine. Um, and hence, we decided to kind of scope out the different perspectives. Um, okay, I suppose one thing to say as well, the development of tolerance, um, it can happen for two reasons, not just one. Um, the first one could be therapeutic reasons where somebody has pain, for example, headache or back pain, that's not managed um, and that's maybe not managed by their prescriber. Um, I mean, they would say that codeine isn't the best pain reliever, that there are stronger synthetic opioids that, that you know, deal with pain much better. So it may be the instance that somebody shouldn't really be using a codeine-based product. Um, and also, you know, the other reason really would be, and something that's come through a lot of the interviews, is the dealing with um, emotional pain, anxiety and stress. Um, so codeine-based products are used for that reason, to help people sleep, to make them relax, um, and to help them get through the day. So again, if you have consecutive use, you have tolerance building up and then you have withdrawals as well. Very often, and I've seen this as well in my time in the pharmacy, um, that it, people become tolerant then they decide to stop. They experience withdrawals, you know, not as strong as a heroin withdrawal, obviously, but a very similar opiate withdrawal, which is characterized by flu-like symptoms and sweating and chills and tummy ache. Um, they think they're sick, so then they go back, I need to take a Norofem plus because I think I'm getting a flu. But actually, they're in withdrawals. Um, and in the two countries I've been in, in South Africa and here, uh, pharmacists do describe switching customers onto Panadol Forte and actually getting them through that withdrawal period, unbeknownst to the person themselves. They've gone through an opiate withdrawal, they think they've had a flu, but they have come out the other end and they now use Panadol Forte if they have a headache or a pain. Um, so again, it's interesting. Um, just to say as well, one of the main concerns with the misuse of codeine products is that often codeine is lumped together with additives, additives like paracetamol and ibuprofen. Um, you know, they work together very well for the management of pain. Um, and so when an individual misuses one of these products over a long period of time, the adverse effects are very much related to the consumption of the paracetamol content and the ibuprofen. So you can get all sorts of horrible um, medical conditions resulting from that in terms of ulcers, pancreatitis, nephrotoxicity. Um, and these are all red flags for doctors when people come in to A&E or they go to visit their local GP. So that's really one of the main reasons why we want to look at this issue. Um, one of the other issues, obviously, is dependence and addiction and people not being able to stop. Um, just the last point there, what's interesting is in the literature is that often 
the dependence on codeine products occurs in groups of people with no history of substance use disorders um, and no history of psychiatric disorder either. Um, so very, very different to drug addict populations themselves. But at the same time, they are a dependent people. Um, the other consequences of misuse, I'll just list them out. So you have impairment, um, which has great implications for road safety, um, particularly if mixed with alcohol. Um, you also have brain damage over a longer period of time. Um, injury risks, particularly amongst elderly patients who are misusing codeine-based products, uh, relating to falls and sedation. Um, overdose. Um, on its own or mixed with other pharmaceuticals or other drugs and alcohol. And the last one is injecting harms when um, codeine is used to make um, a drug injecting solution. Um, and then you have real risk of abscesses and the particular health, health um, consequences that go with injecting drug use. Um, in terms of the types of misuse, you can actually categorize them in terms of how much is consumed. So you have people who never exceed the maximum dose. So in their mind, they legitimize. But I never went over the 240 milligrams per day. I took my four doses and that's it. But yet they could be taking codeine-based products for three years and they don't see themselves as being an addict because in their mind, no, no, I've, I've done what it said on the tin. Um, then you have people who sometimes consume slightly higher than the recommended dose. So those are people who are self-medicating usually for pain or for emotional distress. And then you have people who consume much higher doses. And these ones would be drug users and problematic drug users who use for the intoxicating effect. Um, the characteristics as well, um, I think, just to, to synopsize, really, pain is an underlying factor, whether it's physical or emotional. Um, withdrawals as well. There's another cohort of people um, who are dependent on heroin or on methadone treatment. And when they miss the methadone dose or when they cannot get hold of heroin on the street, they do go to their local pharmacy to buy Norifem Plus because they know it'll manage their withdrawal symptoms and get them over the hump until they can source what they need. Um, okay, so I've kind of gone through that slide. In terms of who they are, we can't actually say who they are because if you look at this slide, it's nearly everybody in the general population, uh, which makes it interesting. It's not sort of if you look at illicit drug use, you can almost confine it to certain risk factors um, and certain groups, but these, this is nearly everybody. It could be anybody. Um, and I have to say, my time in the pharmacy, I have seen everybody, anybody, coming into the pharmacist demanding Norfem Plus or Salpatine. Um, you know, and the pharmacist suspects misuse, the customer gets very um, aggrieved and agitated if it's not sold to them. I mean, it could be your granny, could be your sister, it's anybody. And I think that's why this project is, you know, important in terms of public health. Um, like I said before, once people get sort of caught up in habit-forming use and once they become dependent, there have been some qualitative studies done on this already. Um, and again, they don't identify as being a drug user. Um, they seem to think that because they're able to take codeine-based products and still hold down a job, still go to school, still go to college, still have a marriage, still have their children, that they're not a drug addict and they don't require help. Um, you know, and the other thing as well is that, you know, because the products are legitimately handed to you by the pharmacist, well, it must be safe. You know, I didn't go and stand on the street corner and, and look for heroin or, you know, try and find a dealer. So the fact that it's legal is another major factor uh, in terms of people thinking that it's okay. Um, in terms of behaviours, aberrant behaviours is what I mentioned before, is something that the pharmacists look out for and also doctors. Um, the major ones really are people going to different doctors for different scripts um, and also going to different pharmacies uh, to get over-the-counter products or even dropping different scripts into different pharmacies. Um, 
And so that's a real sign that people need to source more than they, you know, than that's the recommended dosage. Um, red flags in terms of what the pharmacists sort of recognize, I mean, they have described to us when we did focus groups is that they're, they have a sense already when somebody comes in to ask for Norafen Plus, who is misusing? It's the sense that they have, the person, you know, Re requests a certain product, doesn't want to think about Norafen Express because they know it doesn't have codeine in it, and they know what they want. They have pre-rehearsed -re answers to the questions that the pharmacist asks. Um, very often, they, they would the pharmacists have described, and I've seen it too, where they, they would say, well, I have period pain, and they would say that to a male pharmacist in a way to try and you know, create discomfort and that the sale would be a speedy transaction. Or they would ask for Mig Relief, which is a, a codeine-based product specifically sold to manage uh, menstrual pain. Um, so there's, they have tactics. Customers in Australia have, um, as part of a study there, described dressing up in very professional clothes um, looking really professional, um, and that that was much easier then to source the codeine-based products. So, you know, people become quite savvy in, in how trying to get their codeine product. One of the treatment patients I spoke to in South Africa was a lawyer, and she described keeping an Excel sheet of what pharmacy she'd been to and when, so that she wouldn't, you know, pop up too often in the same pharmacy and even the, I'm in a pharmacy in Galway every week as well, and there's one lady who comes in wearing big black sunglasses, and then she'll try and come in not wearing her sunglasses and ask for a different codeine-based product. But that will show you the level of premeditation. Then somebody really is in the throes of addiction. They'll do anything they can to make sure that they have enough for the day and for the next day, just in case, you know? Um, Tampering with coding formulations is something I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. Um, one thing to know as well, this diagram is interesting. There's displacement as well. Um, displacement means a shift in consumer behavior between over-the-counter based products and prescribed products. So you can have one, one before the other or one at the same time as the other. So um, people who are prescribed coding may top themselves up with an over-the-counter product, or vice versa. People on an over-the-counter product may suddenly realize they're tolerant and they need something stronger, so they go to the doctor and complain of pain. Or you have consumption at the same time. Um, this is a little study that I did um, on the internet um, just before code misuse started. I wanted to see what is the codeine intoxication? Why is it that people, people like that feeling? And you know, what is it a trigger for? Um, so basically, the, the, what it is, it, what came through very strongly was the dulling of emotional and physical pain. So people want these were drug users that were interacting on a fora, they would consume codeine because they want to be displaced out of reality. Um, it is an opiate and it causes a very dreamy, sleepy effect. Um, and so they were transported out of their lives for those hours. Um, it was very solitary use as well. People described consuming the codeine um, lying in bed, wrapped up in a duvet, all warm and snuggly, and, you know, the codeine intoxication effect, and, you know, would co completely remove them and detach them from what they were experiencing at the time. Um, what they did experience as well, which was very frightening, was when they were consuming doses of over 240 milligrams, they were actually advocating up to 400 milligrams in one dose to try and get the maximum intoxicating effect. Um, was complete dissociation, very similar to ketamine, dropping into a black hole, basically. Um, and then severe stomach cramps and chest pain. Um, and a feeling of that they were going to die. And there were about five or six individuals who described out-of-body experiences where they actually floated up into the top of their room and they could see themselves in the bed. Um, I'm sure you've, you've read about those kinds of things before, but, um, you know, they didn't die. 
because they were reporting it on the internet, but they said it was so frightening and terrifying that they wouldn't recommend it to any other drug user. Um, so it, you know, that's the, the codeine intoxication phenomena. One of the other things they did experience was synesthesia, was different colors and music and letters having different colors. So very um, psychonautic experiences. One thing they also did was they were very savvy as well on trying to reduce unpleasant side effects. One of the things that happens when you consume too much of an opiate is that you get really itchy. And it's called the opiate itch. So they were very aware that if they took an antihistamine 20 minutes after consuming the codeine product, that that would, you know, get rid of the unpleasant itch. And I mean, it would be so itchy that they would break their skin open. Horrible experience. Um, and they were also using grapefruit, um, which has properties that potentiate um, drug absorption. So you get a faster hit. So anyway, that's, those were the drug users' reporting of their experiences. Um, another thing that came through the literature is the tampering um, with formulations. So you can actually extract codeine out of a combination product if you do a cold water filtration. So what you do is you just crush it up and you put it into cold water into your fridge and it settles. And if you then decant it through a coffee filter, the solution that remains will be the codeine solution, and what's in the, codeine, the coffee filter will be the additives such as the paracetamol. Um, it's all over the internet, and in that way people can avoid the adverse health consequences relating to the paracetamol ibuprofen content, and they can optimize on the codeine effect. Um, you also have across the world in Thailand, in the south of the states where it's mixed with alcohol and mixed with other things like kratom leaves, benzodiazepines, alcohol um, as a drink. Um, and then the very last one is that something that's interesting in terms of manufacture of um, drug injecting solutions in Eastern Europe, Russia, there is a tradition of making home injecting in, um, solutions. And so the codeine-based product is bought in the pharmacy, is cooked up in a certain way using different chemicals, and is then injected. It transfers into desomorphine, um, which can then be injected similar to heroin. So there is a problem with that, and that is actually creeping its way into Europe at the moment uh, with immigration of Eastern Europeans. And we do have a small problem at the moment in Ireland with this issue. The problem really is that the, um, the injecting harms are so severe um, that often the clinicians aren't aware that this is an issue in Ireland when people go into A&E. Um, so it does have its effects. Um, in terms of treatment, the treatment outcomes aren't great. Um, Especially, I think, if pain is involved. So if you have unmanaged physical pain and you put somebody through a detox for addiction, they'll come out the other end, but they'll still have pain that's not managed. And what do they take for pain? If they have a history of habit-forming use. Um, so it needs to be dealt with very sensitively and at the same time. And similarly, if they, there's emotional pain and distress, that needs to be dealt with as well as the physical detoxification from the opiates. Okay, this just to kind of talk about the challenges for policy and pra practice and what we need to achieve with code misuse. Um, you know, it's very difficult to extrapolate the difference between therapeutic misuse and non-therapeutic misuse um, in policy and practice. Um, there's also huge differences in how regulatory authorities deal with codeine um, misuse. Um, there's no monitoring at the moment. Um, South Africa has recently included codeine in its national household survey. Um, the, you know, it's not being covered here in Ireland. Only recently in the last year has it been taken out of the opiate subcategory for treatment admissions. So up until now, all the codeine addicts have been lumped together with the heroin addicts under the opiate classification. So again, we just don't really know. 
Um, and then the last thing I suppose to say is the online retail. The fact that, you know, if you can't get it in your local pharmacies, you can get it with a credit card and a click of your mouse. Um, and it brings huge um, problems with it in terms of counterfeit medicines, substandard medicines, just like what John mentioned here with those sleeping, uh, or not sleeping, slimming tablets. Um, the fact that we don't know what we're buying on the internet. There's no quality assurance. Um, it's very likely that it's, it's a clandestine chemist somewhere in, in China or Israel. Those are the two main countries that are selling into Europe um, that are just making products um, and counterfeiting the packaging and everything so that it looks totally real and plausible. Okay, so I'll fly through these. These are the different recommendations for innovation. Um, so all of these recommendations came on foot of um, interviews that were done in each country with uh, key stakeholders and sort of roundtable discussions. So for manufacturing, I suppose the main objective is to have a look at how the formulation is done um, and how do you stop tampering. So how do you stop people splicing tablets in half? How do you stop people cold water extracting the codeine? Um, some countries, France recently has decided not to sell any combination products anymore. They're just selling codeine on its own in an effort to stop the harms associated with you know, the paracetamol and the ibuprofen content. Um, also as well, one thing that came through was to, to sell less coding. So not to sell a box of 24, but to sell only the three days supply so that the person takes the three days as recommended and that's it. Um, so it certainly warrants consideration. Um, the other thing is to barcode the tablet so that you know where they're being sold. Um, I'm not sure if that would really work. What you often see is family and friends going in to buy for people. Um, so it's difficult, difficult to record these things. Uh, another thing would be to put a logo on it that it's, you know, it's maybe not that logo, but a logo designed um, to sort of register with the consumer that the product carries risk and risk of addiction. This is currently what we have. So we have in a small box contains paracetamol, but for the average customer in a pharmacy, they don't really know what the harms are for paracetamol consumption. Um, the fast acting pain relief is quite a strong message there. And then in a small writing is prolonged regular use can lead to addiction. So maybe not strong enough. Um, and again, it has everything to do with clashes between manufacturer and regulation. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies want to make money. So they don't want their products affected in a negative way. Um, these are different warnings as well. Maybe we could have a look at the different warnings um, to kind of register in people's minds that it carries risk. Um, as well, increasing the visibility of the generic drugs. So the generic drugs would be the paracetamol and the ibuprofen to maybe maximize on that being the content rather than the codeine. Um, and also to initiate specific targeted public health campaigns and sort of the improvement of medicines consumption. What you see here is um, a diagram that looks at non-medical users and pain patients and you'll see that um, they're all quite similar really. You could put one on top of the other. You have, you know, self-treaters, people who, who just self-consume for different reasons, recreation, substance abuse and addiction, substance use disorders. Um, on the side of the pain patients, you have the chemical copers, so people who would, you know, um, drink salpidine instead of a glass of wine when they get at home. Um, and often as well, the pharmacists and the individuals we've interviewed have described a real psychological anticipation when the two fizzy tablets are plonked into the water. And when the fizz is coming up, there's a, you know, a brain uh, trigger, um, not unlike the Pavlov's dogs when the bell was being rung. Um, and all of those are psychological reinforcers for use. Um, 
you know, as well for responsible prescribing, I think one of the things we do need to design is a screening measure uh, for use in primary care where patients can be screened for misuse of over-the-counter products. So not just codeine-based, but, you know, the other ones would be things like um, laxatives. It's another product that's quite often misused for the wrong reasons. Um, Maybe the question is that codeine should be upscheduled itself and it should just be on prescription, as it is in most of the states. Um, and another Cochrane review on whether or not it's the best course of action for pain. We know that there are better pain relievers out there, so why are we still selling codeine over the counter? Um, in terms of responsible pr uh, prescribing. Um, the other thing as well, opioid agreements are quite often used for this stronger synthetic opioid. So that's an agreement between the customer, or sorry, the patient and the doctor, that they both agree that it has a potential for habit-forming use, and they both agree to abide by recommended use protocols. Um, the other thing as well in terms of um, Handwritten prescriptions, um, one of the interviewees that we had suggested that that would avoid repeat prescriptions. I think here, you know, with the cost of going to the doctor, what often happens is the doctor gives a six-month script for a codeine-based product rather than a three. Um, and so that needs to be looked at as well. One other thing here, the discharge of patients from pain clinics and hospitals with non-opioid containing prescriptions. So with other forms of pain medication, not the opioid ones. Um, monitoring coding sales, so you know, what they have in Canada and Australia and, and into the States is real-time monitoring. So they're monitoring the dispensing data in terms of prescription and over-the-counter products. And that gives a really good sense of sales. Um, it doesn't really give a great sense of who's misusing, but it can be expanded to include that option. One of the, pro one of the um, sort of most innovative projects that are currently in the world is Coding Care Project, which is the little sign at the top. What they did in South Africa is they um, benchmarked it at four grams of codeine per person per month, and the person would use a card to scan in, um, and so a red flag would come up for that person if they were trying to purchase over the four grams. And the pharmacist said it was really good because it, it removed them from the conflict. They were able to say, no, I'm sorry, you won't be able to purchase until next week or the week after. Um, I suppose as well, um, increased activity in terms of health information um, on the televisions in pharmacies, uh, leaflets, posters, things like that. Um, development of universal screening measures, not just screening of the people you think are misusing, but screening of everybody who asks for a codeine-based product. Um, asking customers to sign a register. Now, in South Africa, you do have to sign a register. It's a Schedule II register for codeine-based products. Um, and, you know, in a way, that might deter people from misusing codeine, the fact that they have to sign for it. Um, this is the Coding Care Initiative as well. What, another thing that it uses is um, a smartphone application where the person can scan the phone and it gives information on the coding-based product and it'll also ask that person to answer some questions in terms of perhaps triggering in their mind that they might be misusing the product. Um, you can also develop... Um, sort of very brief advice protocols. This is one here. So do you take painkillers? Which ones do you take? Are you aware that use of codeine for more than three days can lead to dependence? Do you know that support is available? One thing that came through very strongly in each country is that pharmacists don't know who to refer to, only back to the primary care service. So if we can give more information to customers in terms of help and support, that will help the issue. Um, in terms of their own medication reviews, to have regular discussions about codeine-based products and other medicines of misuse. Um, 
and also maybe expand the pharmacy service to include community detox. Um, we also did a very small section on safety in the workplace and safety on the road. Uh, in terms of, you know, it does cause impairment for driving, for the operation of machinery and things like that. Um, and, you know, we would like to see codeine and medicines themselves um, woven into employee assistance programs. Um, in terms of the internet supply, I think there needs to be, in general, for public uptake of internet sites, there needs to be more information given on um, counterfeit medicines and the supply of medicines over the internet in general. Um, if you look at the online pharmacies, there's very low levels of e-health and e-screening. So basically anybody can buy anything once you tick a few boxes. So there needs to be a lot more regulation. Um, and investment in M Health is mobile phone messaging, uh, which is a health technology that's really starting to, to come on board for all kinds of health issues um, and can be used very well, um, I would say, within codeine treatment in terms of reminding people to taper down their tablets, to access the local nurse, to go to see the pharmacist for some counselling. Very, very useful. Um, also, the, there are several websites at the moment that have been set up in response to this issue where people haven't been able to go to treatment. Um, and so they, they actually offer detoxification programs online. And they also offer forums where people who are dependent on coding can talk to each other and can get support from each other throughout their detoxification plan. Uh, one of them is called Coding Free, and the other one is Overcount. They're excellent websites if you want to have a look. Um, in terms of treatment, I think we do need to develop standardised protocols for treatment of codeine. I mean, it, it's extremely difficult or different to heroin addiction. Although they're both opiates, but they are very different groups of patients. And so it's not so great to lump them all into the methadone and buprenorphine. Outcomes are not great sometimes. Um, so we need to have specific guidelines for this treatment. Um, we may also need specialist codeine treatment clinics. Um, you know, maybe better than going to access residential treatment. A lot of this can be done within the community. Um, I would say also to probably maximize the use of psychosocial and um, treatments like mindfulness and things like that, you know, because the underlying factor is very often emotional pain. If you can, you know, teach people how to manage their lives and manage their anxiety in a better way, you may have the knock-on effect that they will not become addicted to coding. Um, learning resources as well, um, particularly for pharmacists, they you know, have requested more information on addiction than what they're currently getting in their curricula, um, and also more experiential learning in terms of how to manage conflict, um, how to become resilient uh, in dealing with difficult customers who become agitated when they want what they want, and you're not giving it to me. So there needs to be more training and more support in that area. Um, and then in terms of research, I think we do still need to develop, I think, you know, monitoring systems for each country to monitor misuse of medicines, um, which is currently not being done. Um, I think we definitely need more, more information on risk profiles and how to, you know, interact with people before they become addicted, before they become dependent. Um, and we need to definitely continue monitoring the online supply. Um, because that will only get bigger as people encounter difficulties in sourcing in their local community pharmacy. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Well, we'd like to thank Marie Claire. I think a uh, very important uh, subject area that she's, she's dealing with. And um, I've no doubt that um, when the research finishes up in 10 months' time, uh, that it will produce some important recommendations that will change European uh, policy. Uh, myself and Michael are working with Marie Claire on this, and I'm next to be sent out to South Africa. 
And of course, it's ironic that I'm going out just they're having riots against foreigners. So it <laughs> should be an exciting time when I get out there. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Good luck with the exams. And hopefully, we'll see nearly all of you in September. Thanks very much.